probably the most important passage in um, the discussion of women in ministry is 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. And um, that is, has been, it's important because um, of basically uh, verse 12, where it says, um, I don't allow a woman to teach or to control her husband. Now, usually that is, um, in, in most traditional translations, it says, I don't allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over her husband. And I'm going to explain why I think that's a weak translation and, and misleading in terms of how this word has been used um, in the Greek literature, actually for about 500 years. But uh, the passage is this. It's 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. And it says, Therefore I want men to pray everywhere by lifting up hands that are holy, without anger or argument. In the same way, I want women to enhance their appearance with clothing that is modest and sensible, not with elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. They should make themselves attractive by doing good, which is appropriate for women who claim to honor God. A wife should learn quietly with complete submission. I don't allow a wife to teach or control her husband. Instead, she should be a quiet listener. Adam was formed first and then Eve. Adam wasn't deceived, but rather his wife became the one who stepped over the line because she was completely deceived. But a wife will be brought safely through childbirth if they both continue in faith, love, and holiness together with self-control. Now, this is, a, this is a translation that reflects my views. It is the Common English Bible. Well, I was the editor of that passage. Uh, so here's what the TNAV says on the same passage. So, <laughs> and there were some questions, I'm sure, even from the egalitarians. <laughs> here's, here's how the TNAV reads. Also, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Okay, so far so good. Now, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So. I mean, I could, I could go with this passage and talk about it just the same way. What this passage actually makes the exegetical choices that, that I'm going to be explaining how, the, how those work. So uh, one of the things I talked about is we, uh, before we come to the passages, we have made or we have been taught to make cer certain, certain exegetical choices. And so I'm going to highlight a couple of these. One of these, I'm going to highlight two of these that I think are most important. I could talk about a lot of things that um, people who interpret First <coughs> Timothy will split on, and I can talk about various traditions and the way they handle it. But instead, I'm going to kind of cut to what I would consider the two most essential. One is, what is the nature of First Timothy as a letter? And so um, it, the majority of scholars, and I would say interpreters, uh, take this as a fictive uh, text, a fictive letter, or a literary letter. And what, what that is, is this, this um, actually signals that it's a personal letter from Paul to Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior uh, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my loyal child in the faith. So, you know, some people think Paul didn't write this some people think um, a minority, but, but usually people who have a high view of scripture take it that Paul did write it. Um, some people think that a Pauline circle wrote it. And some people think that Paul wrote it through an amanuensis, which is a, which is a person, it's like a ghost writer or, or a secretary who um, may or may not involve, be involved in the production of the text. We're not going to talk about all the reasons why this, this, is, this is talked about, but this is the case. But the majority, whether you're, you're um, conservative, whether you have a high view of scripture or a low view of scripture, actually say that this is not a personal letter. 
this is what you would call either a fic fictive letter, a fiction letter, um, or a, um, a, a literary letter. And it says it's written from Paul to Timothy, but it's actually written to everybody. And, it, and so it's, it's instructions to all the churches, even though it says it's written from Paul to Timothy as a personal letter. Now, all through um, the book, uh, it basically uses a, a second-person plural, it, consistent with a personal letter that he's talking to Timothy through the whole text. Singular. Yeah, I'm sorry. Second person, thank you for that. I, I said it wrong. I will do that every once in a while. That he is using the second person singular to indicate that he's talking to an individual that is someone who's identified as Timothy all through the text until he gets to the very last verse and says, Grace be with you all. Actually, this one just says, Grace be with you. But, but you would be justified to say uh, to, with you all because all of a sudden we have a second person plural. And so for those who have a high view of scripture, they'll say this means that it's a literary letter. It's really not written to Timothy alone. It's written to everyone. And what that means is that actually it is read mostly as universal. It would lead you to not take the context of situation in Ephesus seriously, because if you do take it seriously, I think you have to take this as a personal letter to Timothy. Now, when I say a personal letter to Timothy, I don't mean it's a private letter. Uh, what I, uh, because in, in letter writing in those days, if someone got a letter, you shared that letter. Everyone's going, you got a letter! You know? uh, and you say, yeah, let me read it to you. you know, it's written to me, but I will share it with you. And I'll explain to you the parts that are left out, because this was written to me, and, um, you know, I meet Paul and I go back 15 years and we're best friends. He considers me a son. And I'm going to be able to explain to you how this stuff fits together because I know what he's talking about. I know not all of you do. And so here's the situation that it marks itself as that kind of letter. It, it recognizes that Paul, that Timothy is embedded in the church in Ephesus, so he closes with sitting kind of the equivalent to say hi to everybody, grace be with you all. And this is in all the papyri, um, not a, well, a, a, a large number of papyri that are personal letters. There's an acknowledgement that this person is a part of a community and there will be greetings sent. That doesn't make it a public letter. It doesn't make it uh, sound like it's to an individual, but it's to everybody. So I take the position that this is a personal letter to Timothy and, and, and from Paul, and th this is a letter between two people who know each other very well. And Paul, uh, Timothy would know Paul's doctrines inside and out. Some people think, say, oh, Paul couldn't have written this because he didn't say anything about justification by faith. They say, why would he say anything about justification by faith to Timothy? Timothy knows all about it. He's been with him for 15 years. He doesn't need to talk about that. And so, uh, he, so people say, well, he's talking about different topics. Well, yes, because it's a di totally different relationship than any of the other relationships, except for the one with Titus. And so this would explain all kinds of differences in the texts. But I'm going to suggest that even if someone thinks that this is a fictitious letter, that someone made it up, if you want to interpret the meaning of the letter, this letter is telling you how you should be interpreting it. You're so, even if Pauline Circle wrote it, I, I have some questions about that, but if, if it was written at another point after Paul died, and they wrote a letter that said this letter was written by Paul, um, an apostle of Jesus Christ to Timothy, it's saying, I want you to interpret this as a letter from Paul to Timothy. Interpret this in the context of the Pauline canon. Interpret it as it was written by Paul. I'm asking you to do that. That's how you're going to understand the meaning of the text. Does that make sense to you? So in one sense, I can just do an end run around the authorship of Paul and say, whether you think this is fictitious and written at another point in time, or whether you think it's written by Paul, it's asking to be interpreted as a letter written by Paul at a certain time in a certain context and situation, and that's how it should be done. Does that sound reasonable to you? Okay, the next um, presupposition about the text is a presupposition that comes in a subheading for most of us. And usually in, in um, 1 Timothy 2.1, we get this instructions for public worship service. And they're... <coughs> So we read instructions for public worship service. That's it. There's a bit of a problem with that. 
And that is, um, and so you're talking about First Timothy 1 through 15 generally. Now, some people break this off to, to avoid it, but for First Timothy 2.12, I permit no women to teach or exercise authority over a man she is to keep silent. They're saying that's for church services. Women's not to teach or have authority in church and church order. And um, the problem with that is twofold. Number one, there's no signal this is a church service. Number two, what does giving birth, being saved through childbirth, have to do with the worship service? And the focus at the end is, is really when you talk about where the passage is going in the, in the instructions to women, to a woman, starting in verse um, 12, or actually 11, it, it's, the culmination is addressing the childbearing issue. And so that doesn't fit a worship service at all. Like I've, like I've said, like I said yesterday, I went into labor once during a church service, and I really made a point of not giving birth in that service. I got out of there. But, but maybe, maybe if I read this more carefully, and I saw this about a worship service, I should have hung in there and just popped it out, right? <laughs> Her out. It was a girl. <laughs> so, Eternal security. <laughs> that's, that's right. I would have secured my salvation right there. And no one could have questioned it. But the question is, why would you say this is a worship service? And they say, well, it's got instructions for praying up here. And so it says, first of all, I urge that application, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving should be made for everyone. And so I said, oh, church service. And then when it gets to the instructions to men, it says, I desire that in every place the men should pray. Worship service. Here's the deal. Have you read Paul? Have you read Luke Acts? Have you read Have you read the Sermon on the Mount? No one, no no author of the New Testament that I have seen ever wants prayer to be limited to a worship service. They're saying basically you're going to pray everywhere, and actually in North America, if you pray everywhere, it might be frowned upon. But in this day and age, it was not frowned upon. Actually, public expressions of religion were normal. And you know, public devotion to Artemis, we saw that, not acts, right? Normal. And so, and so you know, you have people praying on the beach, you have pray, people praying in their closet, you have people praying in the home, you have, you know, and so it, he says, literally, I desire then that in every place the men should pray. I say, oh, that's every, every house church. I wouldn't take it that way because all, all through Paul, he's saying pray every place all the time without ceasing. And I said, well, what about the content? And say, well, yeah. I mean, I would say to have all of my prayer, taking in mind, um, you know, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving may, may, being may, made for everyone, and you pray for your rulers so that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. Well, that seems suitable to prayers in my closet as well as prayers in the church as well as prayers in the house church. So talking about prayer never limits it to time and space. To the contrary, the plain teaching is everywhere. And when you look in the New Testament, prayer, it, prayer goes everywhere. Everywhere. So I, I was like, this is a weird kind of spirituality that says you're going to limit this prayer just to once a week in your church service. Or even, if you meet more often, to limit it when you're gathered together. This is prayer is good for all times and all seasons and all places. And that's the thing that he's actually stressing. So, so I would say no flag, no indication that it's a worship service. Quite the opposite. You pray everywhere and you pray all times without ceasing. This is not a worship service. Not yet. And so when he does flag it, when it becomes one, it becomes quite clear. So, he, he's, uh, so, so he's given this prayer, and he's, he's talking about, um, so he's, he's um, talking about wanting to live a life of quietness and dignity. And then he turns to men and he says, I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and argument. And usually that's ignored. They're saying he wants men to pray in a worship service, and he doesn't want women to pray. That's clear. He wants women to be silent. You know? <laughs> I said, no, rather, he's addressing a problem with men. And he's saying, I want you to pray with holy hands 
and I want you to stop behaving out of anger and stop your arguing and bickering. And so you can read all through First Timothy and read about what a problem there is. The men are opposing Paul. The men are arguing. You can say women too. And I would suggest that he's highlighting men here as the source of this particular problem. And he's going to talk about it at length elsewhere. Actually, and so let's so back up to the beginning of the text now. I made a point to say this is not just limited to uh, a worship service. These are more general instructions. So what is First Timothy about? It says from the very beginning that I urge you as I did, and I'm talking in verse 3, I urge you as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculation rather than the divine training that is known by faith. And I would suggest this is what the, the letter is about. He's trying to help Timothy counter false teaching and so he's trying to equip him and how he's going to do that and I would suggest you know he's starting to say okay here's some antidotes and he goes he goes on gives a little bit of background in chapter one about and it's basically we're still talking about uh, combating the doctrine and fighting the war against the false teaching and then in two one he goes first of all here's the first thing you got to do you got to you got to get down on your knees you got to address this thing in prayer and you got to be praying about the right thing Okay, now let's talk about a first category of problems. And he's finding problems that are gender specific. He's going to talk about the men, not a lot. He's going to return. He's going to focus on them. But he's going to address the majority of his stuff to the women. And so what I'm going to suggest is that the women are involved in false teaching uh, and a certain kind of false teaching or participating in the results of false teaching. This is a little bit difficult because actually when you read the context, you never see women being corrected for their teaching. You see men being identified as false teachers. In 2 Timothy, you see uh, false teachers worming their way into households and captivating weak women. And uh, so you actually see women as a target of false teaching. You see women going house to house and saying things they should not. Well, and what's that? That's the women's culture. And, and man, as you can see, if things are going desperately wrong among the women's culture, that's actually really hard for uh, hard to counter, hard for someone like Timothy to counter, because this is all happening over hearth and home and over the backyard fence. And how are you going to stop them, right? How are you going to stop women um, from spreading things? And so he's going to turn. So with men, I've already said it start. It, you know, they're doing things. Actually, I think it's in chapter six three where it really highlights some of these problems that are related. They're fighting Paul. They're fighting each other, and they're arguing all the time, and they're disputing about stupid things, and um, and they're angry, <laughs> lots of anger, <laughs> and that he try, He's trying to get Timothy to deal with. And so he he opens it and he goes, but but I want to focus on the women. So what are the women doing? Well, we know they're telling old wives tales they're telling they're telling myths spread by old women literally and I know some of the verses try to say this isn't gender specific and I'm going oh yes it is it's definitely gender specific women are the bearers of the culture and the tellers of the story if you've got women telling stories um, to in the home and to each other again very hard the power of stories right so he's saying even Timothy might get drawn she goes don't don't pay attention don't listen to those no those are not those are those do not have their source in scripture so there's myths and I would would think that the genealogies would be part of the women's culture too. I know that the men are interested in genealogies as identity, but again, the women and the keeper of the culture and the meaning of, of our ancestry and the descent and all this kind of stuff, and this is also very meaningful. And um, he's saying, don't, you know, this is not the center of what we're talking about. You know, so don't pay attention to, to the myths that women tell and the genealogies. And so problem with stories and the way they're told. Um, there's a problem with the way women are dressing. And it's not like the veil thing. Actually, it's interesting. You know, it's probably not a worship service because he doesn't even talk about the veil. They're dressing in an ostentatious and wealthy way. They're putting on a show. 
and um, and there are wealthy w widows we can see and that are that are dedicated to luxurious uh, living later on. Just read through Timothy and pick this stuff up. So the widows are some of the widows are wealthy. I imagine there's some wealthy mat matrons too. This would exactly explain why the false teachers are worming their way into the household because there's fine. Oh yeah, that's the other thing the men were they were doing. They were teach they were doing false teaching for gain, for the gain of money. And so you, when you have wealthy women and then they were in their way in the household, you know what, well, there's two things they could be after, right? They could be after the money or they could be trying to draw them into an illicit relationship. But it doesn't sound like it because it actually says that the, there's, going, there's going to be these kinds of false teaching where they, they're going to be rejecting marriage and, and so, so that, or it could be sex, it could be, it could be actually a sexual union so that false teachers are teaching people to be ascetic and to reject things that God has given us for good. And so that we know that the widows were not wanting to get married. We know that from later in the text. We know that there seems to be an issue with having children where Paul says, okay, the widows have been, you know, they've been going door to door and they've been spreading stuff that they shouldn't like slander and gossip. And I want them to get married and have children. And so when you start putting this together, someone is teaching about not having sex, someone is teaching about not getting married, someone is teaching about not having children. And, um, and it sounds like it might be, because we know this actually happened, that, um, that w married women were deciding that maybe they weren't gonna have sex with their husbands anymore. And it, which actually could, if that alone was happening, that could ha that could account for some of the strong language. Paul would not be amused with that, right? Because if you read First Corinthians seven, he says for everyone to have their their spouse uh, to to deal with sexual immorality, and says you you ought to have you ought to be fulfilling each other sexually. And it, it's not like it's sometimes used that women ought to be just doing every kind of you know thing, but again dignity but but that you would be having regular relationships in order in, in order to not be tempted he's he's been very clear about this he would not like this teaching he would be very he would be very opposed to it and we know that from his teaching so this is the kind of things that are happening among the women's culture okay so we talked about men, we've talked about the anger and disputing and opposition to Paul that we see showing up later in the passage that we can see, yeah, that's men. And you know what? We'd probably think it was men anyway, because um, we often, see, you know, we often think of this in this culture, you know, w in a culture that really actually um, presses women into silence. That women are probably not going to be taking on each, uh, men and fighting with them normally. Maybe there were some suggest, but it says, okay, so in, in verse nine, he turns to the women. Uh, I, um, I desire that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently. And again, modesty in this case is talking about modesty in terms of ostentation. When you look at the wording, it doesn't seem to be worried about display of inappropriate skin or something. He, there, he's more targeting inappropriate ostentatious clothing that you know displays status in this and wealth so listen to it women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing not with their hair braided or with gold pearls or expensive clothes but with good works as is um, appropriate for women i like actually my translation they should make themselves attractive by doing good which is appropriate for women who claim to honor god i actually put it in their, in in, their, in their, your face to say paul is saying i want you to adorn yourself that's all good i understand and again it's an attractive thing you know women want to be attractive it's built into us for the most part. I know few women who don't want to be attractive, and usually there's a very strong reason if they don't want to be attractive. And he's saying, no, that's a, the impulse to be attractive is not the problem. But here's how you make yourself attractive by doing good, which is appropriate for women who claim to honor God. Okay, so that, um, like I said, to, to limit this to just the worship service, like get out of the, you know, get out of the house church and dress however you want. No, this is a, um, this is a, a something, a command that he's given for women at all times and all places, including the home. 
This goes, this goes everywhere about how you make yourself attractive. This is not limited to just uh, a couple of hours on one day of the week. Again, it's a sign that it's not a worship service. And like I said, there's no discussion of veiling. And then it goes, and then what, look what happens. We've just talked to men, and we've just talked about women, and now we go to the singular, to a woman, and how a woman relates to a man. Now most of the time with this, when this passage, I'll say the Bible is perfectly clear, women are not allowed to teach men in the church, but that's not what it says. It, it narrows to a wife a, or a woman and her relationship one-on-one -on -one with a man. And so what could possibly be going on here? And I, and I say when you, when you back it up with the creation passage, I think we've got, we've got man and wife. I mean, that's all, and in childbirth, you go cre creation, fall, childbirth. We, we're talking about marital things. And a, and, a, and a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I'll tell you what, you know, in this culture, women didn't go one-on-one -on -one with a man. That was absolutely forbidden. And that's why Timothy actually couldn't get into the household and correct these with the women. He, he couldn't actually directly correct the women's false teaching because there were cultural mores against it. Now think back on 1 Corinthians 14. When, um, when Paul was saying there's a problem with women talking all at once during the service, and he's saying, what could be causing them to talk all at once? Okay, let's just imagine there's a good reason, <laughs> because they wanna learn something. Okay, if you're talking all at once because you want to learn something, what do you do? You go home and ask your husband. And I suggest this is exactly the same scenario when a woman is in, was ensnared by false teaching. How is Paul, what does Paul want? Mm. Paul's going to want the husband to deal with it in the household and the father, if that's appropriate, to deal with these things in the household. And the reason you say, well, what if the wife knows more? You know, the likelihood that the li wife would know more is very, very, very slim. And he's going he's to deal with the default. And that is, you know, from 2 Timothy, that Timothy is passing on um, the things that he, he uh, received from Paul to faithful people who are able to teach others also. And I'm real, I'm real, real strong that that should be faithful people. But the way that had to learn, work out, and especially in the experience of a single man who's working with the church, he's not going to be able to get one-on-one -on -one with those women. So he's going to be wanting to train. He's, he can't access the men. So he's going to be correcting false teaching through the men and saying, now you take this into the home and teach this appropriately. Because men can learn one-on-one -on -one with a man, and men can get together in groups and learn. But a wife's instruction of this kind is going to take place in the home. All women were homeschooled. That's where they got their education or they didn't get their education. And so most women were illiterate by and large. Um, but if they learned how to write, they learned how to write in the home. They never went to a, they never went to a school. They never um, were, you know, given um, we're, we're given that kind of public instruction or that kind of advantage. So what you do, you have uh, men typically are going to be in a better place to work with this kind of thing. And so Paul can say in, in Corinth, and he can say in here, I want a wife to be homeschooled. And when she's homeschooled, and, and particularly in this situation, uh, assume the position of a disciple or a learner, which is to be quiet and to be submissive. This isn't a gender thing. This is when you are being discipled and, and uh, by someone who's knowledgeable, you've got to be quiet and you've got to be submissive to it. And don't be pulling out your myths and genealogies and rah, rah, you know. He's saying, we're not gonna have that. Just calm down now and let's set this straight. And then he says, I don't allow a woman to teach a wife. Now, I'm saying we have wives and husbands. Are, is it okay with you if I call these wives and husbands? Because we're talking about homeschooling, and it's a man and a woman with the marriage passage. So I'm saying it's well signaled. I can get this. It's a wife and a husband. And so he says, I don't allow a wife to teach or control her husband. And um, so everyone, everyone says, look. Uh, well, instead, she should be a quiet listener. And then they say, look, what's the support of that? It's an eternal truth, and therefore, this is an eternal command. And they say, wait a minute. 
it says, what does it say? Does it say it's eternal? No, it says it's not. It says, I don't. And when this is taken out of context, when it says, I don't uh, permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, who's talking? God, right? God doesn't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. But this actually, who's the referent here? It's Paul. Paul's <laughs> saying, I don't allow or I'm not allowing. And so he's actually tagging this. He could say, don't allow a woman to teach or exercise their authority over a man. Or the Lord doesn't want to, but, but what he's really, what he says is, I, Paul, am not allowing a woman to teach or, or control her husband or exercise authority. So by doing that, he's saying, this is me. I'm not invoking all the churches. I'm not invoking, um, you, know, uh, you know, God is a command in this. And he's actually quite careful about this in his instructions in 1 Corinthians 11. Remember, he says, okay, the Lord's saying this one. Okay, in this part, this is me and not the Lord. Now, he's not saying what I say doesn't matter. But he is distinguishing between something that's more prophetic and more straight out of scripture and, and then what his practices are. And I would suggest he's saying, I don't permit a wife to teach or control her husband. And this is news to Timothy, because why does he have to say it? Because you, you know we don't permit a woman to do this. And he's actually saying, this is, he's actually giving information, and I would suggest it's new information to Timothy, a new thought, and something that's extremely important in this situation. However, um, when we look at, I don't allow a, a wife to teach or control her husband, I actually try not to teach or control my husband as a rule. Um, anyway, it doesn't go over well. And um, it, it, I just don't. And, and um, he, I've learned that how to say things to him. If he asks me questions, and he does, and he sits under my teaching, and he listens to me preach sermons, and that's all fine, but, um, but you know, when we're one-on-one, -on -one, I, I've got to be sparing with my imperatives if I use them at all. And so I, I actually, Glenn doesn't like imperatives, my husband, and, but he does like me to give him information and he, takes, he kind of takes a bit of offense at this verse. He says, if I, that means I can't tell him anything he knows, he kind of gets huffy about it and says, what's up with that? You know, and so, but I think what you're talking about here okay, in a situation and, and, and so I'm saying these kind of dynamics between male and female are probably gonna, gonna go anyway. But he says, I'm not gonna, don't reverse this thing. I want men to homeschool the women. Now, none of you start homeschooling men and don't do this role reversal. You, he, the, I'm having the husbands teach the women. That's how I'm controlling this thing. I don't want it reversed. And furthermore, then I don't want her to do what to her husband. And so people say, exercise authority. I don't want her to have any authority over her husband. Well, that's funny because in 1 Corinthians 7, he does say he wants the wife to have authority over her husband. Talk about mutual authority over one another in their bodies. And so he, this, this places him in contradiction. But this is a strange word. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, on this. I, I've got an article out in the web where I've done a linguistic study on this word. <clears throat> and I've, I've gone through all the occurrences. And I've taken out the parts that are interpreting the Bible itself. And I'm taking the word as it's, um, uh, th th that are all tied in with this passage. I'm just, I've just looked at the occurrences where it's used in public discourse. So first of all, this is what we call a hopex legomena. It's the only time it's used in scripture. Second of all, uh, we don't have in the literature, at least we have now, any form or occurrence of this verb. That is to say, on record, we have, no one has said this verb on record, in writing, that we have. And so this is the first instance of a word and so there's no prior context to the use of this word that we can look at. All we can look at is later uses of it. So that's what we have. We could look at the noun and we could say, okay, we, could, we, we think that he made up, maybe he made up this verse from the noun or someone made up the verse from the noun. And that would get, land you in the same place where I'm going to land you. And that is, this, ver this word is a word that's not just authority. In fact, authority is a misleading word. This is a word that talks about the exercise of lethal force. 
or something like lethal force. And so when people say, and, and so you know, the egalitarians say, this is a terrible word, it's bad. And the complementarians say, no, it's a good word, God does it. And I said, well, it's both, it depends on the context, you know, so you have, and, and they're actually patterns. So when God does it, yes, God does it. First of all, he's got to do, you got to look at the cases where it's done to a person. You just can't look at all the cases. You got to have a direct object to be, it, it, because when you have a direct object, then certain patterns form. So when God does it to people, he does it to the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they die. And so, and we say, this is good that he does this. We're supposed to be happy about that. He did it to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Sodom and Gomorrah was completely destroyed. He does it to the wicked, and they are killed. And we're saying, that's just, and that's God's job. Okay, positive evaluation, but you don't want to be the recipient of this. You don't want to be the direct object. No one wants to be the direct object. And a Caesar does it because he has complete control. Um, executioner does it, right of life and death over, um, over the criminal. And, and that was, so, yay, he executes the criminal, good job. Uh, so anyone who has full power and control over someone and uses force, that's their job. Um, and, and there are jobs in which this is done. Most of the occurrences, they, didn't have the, they don't have the authority. And so that's why you get the word usurp instead of authority. You go, how can you have usurp and authority? Well, it really doesn't mean authority because I think to have authority, you're authorized. And so most of the cases, it's doing something where you don't have authority. And so something that's occurred to me lately is that I think that the role of a paterfamilias in the Greco-Roman Empire actually was um, a role in which they would say a man is allowed to authenticate his wife and children. This because the paterfamilias, at least traditionally, um, had the right of life and death over his family, so he could actually kill his wife or children if it suited him. So actually, that's su that's suitable, and you can say uh, that maybe the the uh, Roman government and the Roman law thought that a man could authent legally had the authority to kill his wife and children or to make them do something they didn't want to do. Meaning, meaning it's not always about dying and being murdered. There's a lot of things about you know, people murdering people, and this is described with this word. It's really, really bad, you know? But if a husband uh, killed his children because they were disobedient, or killed his wife because she was disobedient and had an affair, that's his right. Now, I think that was being challenged in this time, but you understand these things hang on. So at the very least, it, you, you understand Paul doesn't want men to treat their wives that way. He doesn't want them to take the power of life and death over his wives. He wants them to love their, their wives. And so he's been trying to teach all over the place, do not take the right of life and death over. Don't treat your wife that way. That's not the core that you're acting out of. And so here he's saying, Okay, first of all, you're not going to be teaching your, your uh, husbands. You, you know, the whole women's culture is full of false teaching. We have to deal with that. And furthermore, no role reversals here in terms of I'm not going to have you acting like a paterfamilias and um, ta you know, taking the idea that somehow Christianity or, s or something has, has, has justified you becoming a dominant in this relationship, like they could be telling stories or justifying themselves becoming a dominant. And so God doesn't want a dominant. Uh, Paul doesn't teach a dominant. He's teaching people to come alongside each other, not dominate each other. And so, but you know how it is. Sometimes we're accused of saying we want women to be dominant. That's not what the teaching is at all. The teaching is for everybody to actually compete in showing honor to one another. The, the teaching is to serve one another. The teaching <laughs> is to be slaves of one another. So actually, if women continue to do what they're trained to do and serve, and women and men are also trying to serve, then we, then we meet at the bottom. And that's, that's what Paul's teaching. So he says, I absolutely don't want you running around like a paterfamilias and dominating people like you think that's what you're supposed to do. Is it utterly out? Instead, she should be a quiet listener. So Adam was formed first, then Eve, and, and Eve wasn't, Adam wasn't deceived, but rather his, Eve, rather his wife became the one who stepped over the line because she was completely deceived. Now, there's a little conjunction at, in verse 13, it's called a gar, and it, it really actually doesn't explain much of anything except it's telling you I'm going to support what I just said. And so what we have here is that actually this is said, okay, here's a transcendental norm because he's citing like a proposition from creation. But do you notice that's not a proposition, that's a narrative. 
he, he summarizes the narrative of creation in a little tiny way. We're just going to boil this down and say Adam was born first in Eve. Adam wasn't deceived, but his wife was the one who stepped over the line and she completely became deceived. We don't know why this is invoked and we don't know in what way this supports. Now, it's been taken that women, you no, know, this is a universal because it is a literary letter written to everybody, so, and here's a universal, because we have creation, and therefore this is a command for everybody at all times, and here's the reason for it. And then they actually treat this as if it's a propositional statement, but it's just a, a summary of creation. So I'm gonna say three things. Um, number, number one is that this could be typology. Uh, it, because um, he, uh, Paul is asking Timothy to spiritually form or transform the men and teach them, and then to and then for Eve to be transformed. He's also saying that you know that that, that this kind of deception that's being corrected is not in the male, but among the males, but the ones are, but the wives are the ones that are deceived and stepping over the line. So you can see all kinds of parallels between what's going on in Ephesus and why it needs to be corrected. It could also be, and I actually like this, I actually like the two together really work. What are those myths that those old world, uh, women are telling? And so we actually have a relatively early Gnostic myth in which the creation order was reversed, and in which uh, women were created first and then men caused all the problems, you know, and, you know, and we reap the benefits. And so p people say, oh, that was, that was 100 years later. I say, yeah, but the Gnostics tra uh, claim that they had an oral tradition. And so why couldn't the oral tradition go as long and as deep as the Christian oral tradition? And so that, and even apart from that, that myth popping up in exactly the same area, finally written down, could have started here or started earlier. This kind of reverse, this kind of um, subversion by story and reversing a story is actually a very normal thing, particularly in the women's cultures that tell stories. They will tell this, they will, they will reverse um, places, they will reverse names and everything, and, they will, and, and that's one of the ways that they deal with things. And so there was a problem with, with myths. Is this correcting a myth? I will tell you one thing for sure, is this, that, that uh, the creation and the deception and fall leads straight into verse 15. It's not read this way, but as a woman who actually has read Genesis 3 once or twice, and the, and the accounts before that, when I look at the creation and I look at fall, and then I see childbirth mentioned, where am I? I'm, I'm in the effects of the fall on women. Because what happened to women, and we're always talking about, yeah, your, your, your husband will rule over you. Actually, women are, uh, uh, historically are much, much more interested in the increase of childbirth and the increase of pain and the increase of labor because they die. They die, do they not? And so um, one of the worst instances of, infant morta of maternal mortality today is one out of seven births, the mother dies. And that's today. So you think it's not gonna be better than that <laughs> back, back in the first century. And plus you have practices like uh, men forcing their wives to have an abortions, abortion by which they died. Women were dying for all kinds of reasons. And, um, and, and when we try to address maternal mortality today, one of the things we need to do is, is speak to the husbands because the husband's behavior is contributing directly to a high maternal mortality. And that is if they beat their wife while, she was pre while she's pregnant, she dies. If she has trouble with her birth, they gotta go and find a midwife for her. If they don't, she dies. Um, if they, if she, um, when they serve food, instead of putting their wife at the end of the line and the last person to receive a share of the food after everyone else has had their share, uh, <coughs> she becomes malnourished and she becomes more at risk. We could go on and on and on as to why in some of these soci well patriarchal societies that, that the behavior of a husband can directly is linked to maternal mortality. So women, people die, women think about these things. One of the big things about women's religion and a bit, the major concern of women through history until modern medicine is how can I limit the, the number of children I have so my, basically my whole bottom doesn't fall out. 
and, and, and how am I going to make it through this next childbirth? Because if, if, if things go normally, you're going to have about 20 or you die because chances are your number comes up. Uh, without many childbirths, and so this is a big concern. It's right there in the fall, and so when, so this is this uh, so this is the wording. This is what I think's in view because it's what you call constrained by the Old Testament passage. You're already reading it. Is that a wife will be brought safely through childbirth if they both? Now I now I added the both in because the they has been so ambiguous and so confused. But in Greek, there's a woman or the women will be brought safe, it's, I think it's a women, I think it's, but will be brought safely through childbirth, or uh, if they both continue, because who's, who's the antecedent? Well, I was taught, if I have uh, a reference like this, the antecedent is the closest people in the text, so I'm going to Adam and Eve who represent the man and the woman in the text, the husband and wife is the whole link. So the they refers probably to Adam and Eve and the man and the woman. They will be both, they, she will be brought safe, safe through childbirth if they, if they both continue in faith, love, and holiness together with self-control. The impact on this is that a, wo a man changes his behavior and a woman is more likely to survive if just her husband behaves towards her with faith, love, and holiness together with self-control. As far as the woman is concerned, if she behaves with faith, love, and holiness together with self-control, she is saved from a, a much worse fate than death, the danger of idolatry, because especially in Ephesus, a woman is fully immersed in a woman's culture that goes to Artemis when she when she is, uh, gives birth, and you use magic and you use spells because Artemis is the goddess of childbirth and guides every woman through every stage of life, and she's the savior and the healer. And so you can just see the scenario that a, that a woman is 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 on her deathbed, and she goes, "Well, bring in the Artemis stuff, mom." do your thing, <laughs> you know, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm desperate now. And, where do, and then she dies. Where does that place her? And, and that, to Paul, that would be the greatest danger of all. And so, you know, he's giving instructions to where he's helping women to make it through so they're spiritually safe. And he's instructing men to have behavior that actually will roll back the fall in regards to the effect on women. Now people have said, I think this is salvation. I think a woman is saved through childbirth. And my response is, how can, you, how can a woman be saved through childbirth when all people are justified by faith through Christ? And they go, it's a tension I'm willing to hold on to. You know, no, they, they come up with explanations, but none of them are good. Because in the end, this is a contingent salvation. They'll say, well, this is a, a wife, and this is Tom Schreiner said, well, I think we're really talking about is a woman is saved through sanctification, which is fulfilling. What, childbirth must be the woman's function and role, God-given function and role. So a woman is saved by doing her proper wifely function and role if she continues in faith, love, and holiness together with self-control. And I'm like, and who's the they? I say, oh, that's the women of Ephesus. And I say, we're lost. We're all lost. <laughs> if I'm dependent on the women of Ephesus, nobody's saved. You know? No women are saved. That is all, only men. It's, 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 it sounds like all kinds of contingencies based on salvation. And it's unwarranted for the language. This saved is used for rescue, uh, healing, and all kinds of things. So I just would take you to, um, for a last thing to say, this can't be women are saved through childbirth because they do die. I say yes. And so in James, it says, if anyone is sick, send for the elders of the church to anoint him and, and you know, if, and pray for him and they will be saved. Same word, D different, it's, it's, it's conjugated a little differently, meaning same thing. And he will be saved, he will be healed. And if he has sins, they'll be forgiven him or she, I take this, he or she, but uh, they'll be forgiven them. So same exact words and say, but sometimes they die, don't they? 
And yeah, so the idea is, of course, healing is in mind. But for Paul, the, the idea of, of healing is a full orbed thing and rescue is a full orbed thing. And it place, this places yourself in the hands of God and in the hands of prayer. And then whatever happens, you're safe in God's hands. This places you in God's hands. That's a big thing for women. You know, women, women, we, we see that the fall has been rolled back as far as Adam is concerned. You see a lot of writing about that. And yet you see no one concerned about rolling back the fall for women. In fact, you actually see in the history of the church, they think that instead of rolling back the fall for women, they're supposed to enforce the consequences of the fall. That has been very common. This shows that actually Paul said, yes, God cares about you. I care about you. Let me talk to give you some healing and sanctifying words against this horrible danger you face, some of you, every single year. And uh, the, 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 the plight of women in childbirth historically has been, I mean, they, men use it for the worst thing, worst fear possible when they're in battle. It's in the Bible all over the place. I was in war and I was, I was in fear like a woman in labor. I was shaking and, and screaming, you know. And the, the men knew, the men knew how horrendously threatening it was. So I think this is a message of hope, but it's also a message of correction. But it's not saying all women, all women are doing the things that the women in Ephesians are doing, although when you take it as a literary thing to all the churches, it's, you would take that maybe as just the, the, the uh, kinds of things that are happening in Ephesus. You would take, these are how women are. And I think that that leads to a pejorative evalu I know it leads to an pejorative, evalu uh, pejorative evaluation of women. But I encourage you to look at this as a situational text addressed to Ephesus, to address the problems in Ephesus, but it's not like they don't have applications to the rest of the women and men. They do. But you've got to recognize first who, who are the recipients and what did it mean for them. Now what does it mean for you?